The obsession of the addict is not for the drug use. The obsession is often perceived to be the addict's incessant train of thoughts about using a drug. This might be true in the very beginning when they are still experiencing intense cravings. They will incessantly think about the quickest way they know how to get relief from those undesirable feels. But what about later in the game? What about when the withdrawals have been gone for weeks and months, and when the intense cravings subside? Let's say an addict has quit and even applied the craving stomper technique of satisfying Scaredy Cat's basic survival essentials described earlier. Is that enough? No. All that did was remove two bullets from the gun. I stumbled upon this insight on complete accident, but I think it hits a home run. So let me tell you a little story to set this up. I use alcohol in this story, but of course, you can supplement any drug for the concept. I was talking with a client one day, and we had about an hour to kill. Once you get past the conversational pleasantries, generally, life stressors start to hop in, and she knew I knew a lot about this kind of stuff. She said her son had a bad drinking problem, and she was curious if I had any info that could help. I asked her what it was she wanted to know. She asked what everyone else asks. Why can't he just stop? Now, normally I would try to cram the breakdown of all I have already gone over with you into a tiny span of time, but that always proves difficult for most to download and apply. Or I would bring to light one of their own vices, too much work, shopping, phone, chocolate, or whatever, and ask them why they can't stop. But that route is always met with the same resistance. But it's different, they say. Sure it is. No, this time I tried a different approach. I asked her, do you drink sometimes? Her response was the usual, on occasion, socially. And that's when the great spirit started speaking through me. A.K.A., I went on a long-ass rant which sounded something like this. How would you feel about not drinking for one year? Only one year of your life. For whatever reason, just for argument's sake, like if you were on some sort of life-saving medication that didn't allow any alcohol consumption, how would you feel about one entire year of sobriety? Before you answer, think long and hard about it, because I can guarantee your son surely has. No drinking on your birthday. No sneaking a sip when the ball drops on New Year's. Christmas parties, 4th of July, St. Patrick's Day, Cinco de Mayo. All these holidays, you're dry. If you're nervous on a first date, you're going to be sober the entire date, even if it looks like the date could end well in your bedroom. Each and every graduation party, dinners with people you don't tolerate well, christening a newly purchased home, bachelorette parties, sporting events, and wedding receptions. Even if your own wedding falls in this year, you got to raise your glass of juice or soda when everyone cheerfully toasts. Let's see. What else? Yearly vacations, trips to the cabin, or going on a cruise that you worked so hard for. You're on the water diet the whole time. When the proverbial feces hits the fan and splatters all over your life, a close relative passes away, you get laid off, had a horrible work week, ugly divorce, fender bender, a fight with your best friend, anything that happens, you need to deal with it naturally. No quick relief from a cocktail. I know you don't have a drinking problem. You can control it. You don't drink too much, and you could easily pass up the party favors in any of the scenarios I just listed. I know you can do it, but how would you feel about it if you couldn't use alcohol for one year straight? No cheat days, not one drink. Her response was, since you put it that way, it would absolutely suck. I was on a roll, getting to a point I didn't know existed yet. So I continued. Do you think there might be any auxiliary repercussions? Do you think your friends and family or coworkers might start treating you a little different? Do you think you might eventually be invited to a few less shindigs? Might you feel left out? Maybe get gossiped about? Become viewed more as a goody-goody two-shoes? Or less trustworthy around their boisterous behavior, like if they wanted to talk trash about the boss or something. The conversation went on a little more, but the moral of the story is, if someone runs the tape, if they actually think about it, 
Even the normiest of normies find the prospect of getting through just one year without drinking alcohol an absurd concept, if not the most socially awkward year of their adult life. It's not an easy feat, even for someone who thinks they couldn't care less about alcohol. Most simply never needed to think about it in deep detail. Most never needed to fast forward through the movie of an entire year's worth of scenarios to see how many instances this drug is tooled for. And why would they? It's never been a problem. Until it is. It's always been an option. Whether they want it or not, the option is still there. It's funny how unaware we can be of something until it's taken away. Now, I have spoken with a few normies who had experienced this peculiar sort of absence. Yes, I said absence. And what they had found was surprising. To the masses, drinking is a completely normal, acceptable, and expected behavior. It's expected. Even the people who are not an alcoholic or don't even like to drink feel the pressure to do so, sometimes nursing an alcoholic beverage for hours at a party simply for the look. It's a common thread woven through almost every aspect of the social fabric. So much so, its omnipresence is taken for granted, like oxygen. Almost everyone, alcoholic or not, and you can put addict in there too, learned from a young age that one of the best ways to adjust their inner world to interface better with their social environment is to add a magical potion to the mix, to have more fun, relax. Elevate or alleviate emotions, mourn, deal with stress or pain, celebrate, and all the other things we observed older people using it for throughout our development. Even if the parents were sober, and even if it wasn't alcohol specifically, we see people using drugs, advertisements for drugs, and certain lifestyles associated with drugs plentifully. Whether we realized this was what we were being taught or not, we still saw it. As children, raised in an alcoholic, addict, family, or not, we observed our parents and other adults drinking at fairs, picnics, vacations, and most social functions. Christ, they even took a shot of wine during Sunday service. We saw them doing it to have fun and get silly. We saw them do it to decompress. We saw them doing it almost everywhere there were adults past 6 p.m. It persisted in movies, commercials, magazines, billboards, and glorified in music as well. Oh, and don't forget social media. This behavior of consuming a special concoction which only the adults were allowed to have is imprinted onto almost every child's psyche during their most personality-forming years of development. Once again, through the child's observation of the people they are hardwired to learn how to function in this world from. One more time. Through the child's observation of the people they are hardwired to learn how to function in this world from adults. Then stress builds as we get older, alcoholic or not. Curiosity about the power of these magical potions blooms. As teenagers, we begin to feel the squeeze of expectations and the relentless pressure to satisfy the primal need to be included in a group to fit in. Anyone who has tried it knows it works very well, just as advertised. There's nothing like using a product that works. It makes no difference whether what we had observed throughout our entire development was responsible drug use or not. The message is still engraved on the granite walls of almost everyone's mind that the act of using drugs in general is a common and normal way to mend and enhance the experiences of life, not to mention the coolest. And remember, I'm not only addressing alcohol. I haven't even touched on psychiatric meds, marijuana, coffee, sugar, gambling, smartphones, tobacco, and all the other flavors of drugs and behaviors the masses use on a regular basis to manage their daily lives with. That would be the all-encompassing program we all downloaded to throw a drug at each and every discomfort we have, but that would be getting off topic. The fact remains the great obsession for drinking, whether it negatively impacts an individual's life or not, is not solely owned by the alcoholics. It is an obsession held by the masses. It's such a staple in societies across the plane of human existence that if alcohol were to vanish tomorrow with no way to produce more, the entire world's economy would undoubtedly collapse without recovery. 
and major cities would certainly burn in flames until another drug became normal, but that's just my opinion. When my struggle began, when my friendly assassin stopped being so friendly, when my biopsychosocial spiritual consequences became too much to bear, and when I first began revising the contracts I had made with my consumption, I was more than willing to give up the amount I drank, if I could, and believe me, I tried. I was more than willing to give up the extra high from those extra drinks if only to retain my access to something which made me feel normal. Yes, the euphoric properties of the drug made me feel normal by reducing anxiety, but there was another overlooked aspect to my urges. It was the primal, hardwired need for inclusion. Alcohol made it easy to weave myself into the social fabric. It let me ease into social circles. It let me bond seamlessly with anyone holding a glass. But when it got to the point where I knew I needed to quit drinking, I was not only faced with the mental cravings and crash courses on how to cope with daily stressors without the drug, but I also needed to heal my shame of being removed from my fellow drinkers, my herd. I was threatened with being ostracized and sentenced to roam the land alone. I was simultaneously surrounded by, yet separated from, a herd who could all still enjoy the universal obsession. And I felt passively segregated from a group I had thought of as family because, let's face it, if I got enough drinks in me, everyone in the room was family. You want to know what's not considered normal behavior by the herd of which I once belonged? Living an alcohol-free life. Ironically, having the strength to be yourself and get through a social function while sober and still enjoy it is some sort of threat to the people who choose not to. Those in early recovery and normies alike are quite familiar with receiving strange looks or the phrase, oh, come on, you can have just one, when they turn down an offer for an alcoholic beverage at certain events. Not every event, but enough. Or the extra loud confirmation to the immediate area that this guy needs a water. Can somebody get this guy a water or something? I know there's a beer in the fridge, Pete, but this guy needs a water or a soda. Do we have soda? Do you want a soda, dude? Which is just party language for this guy over here is not drinking. Or the obvious lack of invitations to certain social functions altogether. I will admit, for me, most of this treatment is most definitely karma. Even if the host and other attendees of a party are open-minded and tolerant of one's lifestyle choice to be sober, just wait and watch. Let that shindig run its course for another couple few hours. Let those tolerant-minded drinkers get past their first few drinks. Let the sun go down. Observe who the drinkers tend to gravitate towards, who they are talking with the most, who they are laughing with the most, who they are dancing with, who they are hooking up with, who they are networking with. Before you know it, those same people who exchange their formal pleasantries at the start of the evening will be as segregated as a high school cafeteria halfway through the night. Here's another little experiment. Throw a party on a Saturday night that starts after 7 p.m. On the invitation, note that the venue does not allow alcoholic beverages on the premises. One month later, Throw another party with the two words open bar on the invitation. I don't care if your friends and family are problem drinkers or not. You know what the difference in attendance will be. I'm not trying to disrespect, judge, or hate on any type of drinker. I am simply revealing an aspect of recovery that I, and darn near everyone around me, seem to overlook. That the obsession for drinking is shared by so many people, not just the alcoholics and I felt like a member of a popular group called The Drinkers. When I had to leave this group, it triggered an identity crisis within my already paper-thin shell, an identity crisis I was unaware of for more years of attempted sobriety than I cared to admit. I needed to confront a harsh truth. I had to become one of those people I once looked down upon. I had to become one of those people I viewed as weak, broken, and cursed. I had a choice. To become one of those people I had dismayed for over a decade or die trying to hold on to my old ideals with a cast iron grip which had rusted and seized shut. You see, even after being sober for a while, like a couple years, 
It was easy to look across the pasture and miss the old herd. It was easy to long for the automatic connection to anyone holding a drink and the involvement in all the reindeer games. It wasn't until I found a different herd, a community who had learned how to build and enjoy a life without any need for alcoholic enhancements or crutches. A group of fellows who showed me that we hadn't been cut off from the normal people but were simply forced to escape the same obsession so many unknowingly had. I realized it was okay for me to let go of my obsession for inclusion in what I had thought was normal, and it was okay to admit I am different from many but not all. Through the teachings and practices of my new herd, I learned to be comfortable with a new normal, and it was this social shift which allowed me to focus on what I truly needed to do to live a better life, instead of looking at what everyone else was doing. The true obsession of the alcoholic is not for the high of the drug. The role of obsession in the addict is to satisfy a social need that's ingrained in the hearts of absolutely everybody, to stay with the herd they are most familiar with, identify with, and to not be any more alone than they already feel in this world. Since there is no cure, there is no way for an addict to dance with the desired effect and not get fucked by it later, everyone sees the alcoholic relapsing in their attempts to regain something they had lost. But even the alcoholic does not realize what they're truly obsessing over. They think the drug has some sort of magical power over them because they're looking at the wrong thing. It's not the drug they want back, it's the familiarity of the types of people, places, and things, rituals, etc. Because even hell gets comfortable if you've been there long enough. The sad truth is, if nobody around the alcoholic drank, and you can flip the words around for the addict, if it weren't constantly in their face, if what they saw in the world was only non-alcoholic consumption, it wouldn't bother the alcoholic one bit to stay sober after they had decided to quit and stomped out the cravings because if this were the case, the person drinking alcohol would be the outcast. Here's the thing. Until this notion is realized that the addict's obsession was normalized to them by everyone around them, the addict will continue to step into the boxing ring with their drug of choice, round after round, trying to defeat their trait, an 800-pound gorilla, thinking the whole time they can find a way to control it, the alcoholic just wants to control it so they can continue doing it like everyone else and be accepted back in the herd.